Hello, I am River Jordan with Parnassus Books in Nashville, Tennessee, with some very exciting news. I am here with the author Sue Monk Kidd, who is one of our favorite authors in the entire world on the planet. And we get to be the first person, the first store to kick off her new book club for the Book of Longings. So welcome, Sue. Thank you so much for taking time to visit with us and to be able to reach out to your readers like this. Oh, this is so exciting for me, and I am really thrilled at how the readers of the Book of Longings have engaged with this book. It makes me so happy, and I appreciate, River, you talking with me about the book today, about part one of the book. That's right. I only get part one. That's a little frustrating <laughs> as a reader and a bookseller because uh, I want to I want to talk about all of it, but I will brush stroke my way through some sneaky questions that I want to get in there. But we are also so excited to announce that it's number one on indie bound on the indie bound list. So um, yes, obviously the readers have been um, embracing it from the very beginning. You know, just the very beginning. But, uh, well, I have know. loved every comment. I, re I read every comment on social media from my readers. I wish I could respond to every one of them, but I take them to heart and I love the thoughtfulness and the depth and the vulnerability. I mean, it's amazing to me, um, readers, all of your comments and how you're uh, reading the book and what you're experiencing. It um, means a lot. It's your work has, that has generated that response though and, and the beauty of your language. I, wanna, I want to not get so excited that I don't ask you a few questions that are important. So uh, just for readers, for the beginning of the book club, this is part one. You can share this information, please, please. Post it on your social media, share it with your friends, drop a note, send an email so that they know they haven't missed the entire thing that they can catch up and join right in and be a part of the book club all, all along for the book of longings. And before we go, I'll let you know how you can order that from Parnassus Books. So, you know, I just, I just want to address one of the things is, it, and I can't ask the questions that your readers have already sent in. We're going to feature some of the questions from your readers and that's one of the things that, you know, they have some of my favorite questions, but I, want to ask you where the language for the book and the characters came from because from the opening line from the opening paragraph and pages you are suddenly in another world and the language is absolutely beautiful well i never know exactly where this comes from but i felt like anna's voice had to be both um contemporary and true to 2000 years ago. And since I wasn't alive then, I have no idea what that might have sounded like. So I had to sort of imagine that. So it's a hybrid of a woman who I needed to relate to my readers with her voice so that she didn't sound too far, far back in history, and, um, but make her feel authentic. And I felt her voice from the moment she stepped onto the page and said, I am Anna. I am the wife of Jesus Ben Joseph of Nazareth. I felt her voice. And so I just followed it. Um, and I'll say one more thing about that. You know, Anna has a line in, in the book which says that she believes that when she writes, she's making little ink temples for God to inhabit. Now, because of that, because she values words and language, I wanted to make her voice beautiful. And um, so I did my best to do that so that her words elevate language. You certainly accomplished it. And um, what a wonderful blending with history and contemporary. But yes, making her a woman of our times. Uh, not only her times, you know. So this idea of uh, focusing on Anna and her relationship with Yalta, am I saying that correctly, Yalta? 
Yes, yes. Okay, okay. I just want to be sure when you read a writer's words and their names, you're never absolutely certain. So, um, and, you, and you, you incorporate the, the subjects of largeness and thunder in part one. Can you just elaborate and talk a little bit more about that and their relationship? Yes, um, well, if I were to try to distill <laughs> part one into three words, it probably would be longings, largeness, and thunder. Um, Anna was full of longings. I mean, that's where the title comes from. And she opens up the first paragraph saying, my life was begging to be born. Um, I think there's a lot of relevance in that too. I think a lot of women feel that way. I know I have in my life. Um, so that longing that's inside of her is, is palpable. And she longs to um, write, uh, you know, to, to bring forth this large, and she wants to have a voice in the world. Um, I identify with her. <laughs> I mean, I have felt all of this in my life. So I once had some quotations stenciled in the stairwell that went up to my writing study upstairs. And one of them at the very top was about living out loud. It was a quote by the French novelist Emile Zola, who said, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, if you ask me what I came to do in this world, I, as an artist, will tell you I came to live out loud. And I think I, as a woman, too, came to live out loud, but we must um, bring forth our voice and our largeness, I thought. So, so what is our largeness? Oh, I have described it as our particular genius. I, I like to demystify the word genius a little bit and talk about how we all have this um, inner resource in us, something that is all unique to us, that we can offer, that we can voice. And um, Anna had hers. It was her giftedness. I mean, she had a lot of giftedness. And I'll tell you why. Because if she's going to marry Jesus, she's got to be something. I mean, she's got to have her magnitude, her power her passion, because I wanted her to meet him full on, to be a real partner to him. And to learn, I wanted him to learn from her, if you know what I mean. So they learn from each other. Um, so in order to do that, I gave her a lot of largeness. And she was um, gifted with her writing, with her um, scholastic abilities, you know, she wanted to be a scribe, and she was shut down everywhere she turned, basically. Um, the silencing of Anna was, the silencing of any woman is painful to me, and um, there's a, a line in the, I hope it's in the first part, I would hate to venture out of the lines here, uh, which is that we, every pain wants to be witnessed. Um, Anna felt that. She wanted to witness the pain of, and brokenness and heartache, the forgottenness of other women, the lost stories. And she, that was her, her mission. And so she had to have somebody help her to bring this forth. And it was Yatha. I wish I'd had a Yatha in my life. Um, it was only later I found some Yathas, and I think we can cultivate them as women. But Yatha... And, it, yeah. and become them by that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, become them. And Yatha was this spiritual midwife, really, to Anna. She helped her bring forth her her spiritual life. The first time, the first, one of the early scenes, of course, it, it, actually it's the opening scene, is where she gives Anna this incantation bowl. And this is the gift of gifts for her. Um, I'm going to make one of these bowls for myself. 
and I'm going to write my prayer inside it. And I would invite you to figure out how to do that. I mean, even if you get an old piece of pottery in your house. Um, and then get a Yaltha in your life to, to bless it, to bless your prayer and to bless the largeness in you. And since they're very hard to come by sometimes, I'm going to play the role of Yaltha for a second. And look, I wish I could see all of these readers and look at you and say, I bless the largeness in you. And I do. And I believe in it. So I really feel like if we can find someone to validate that for us, it helps tremendously. But ultimately, it comes from within us, that ability to nurture or mother that uh, largeness for ourselves. So Yaltha is crucial to Anna. She's really a lifeline, and they form this sacred alliance that will go on through the entire book. And there's much more to come about Yaltha and her, um, as the story unfolds that I won't give away in case you're actually reading the schedule. Oh, well, that's, we don't mind you going outside <laughs> the lines and coloring outside the lines because I have news for you. You did it when you wrote the book. You were already outside the lines, you know. And, yeah, yeah and, you think? <laughs> So, yeah, I, I okay. said I went way out on the literary limb on this one. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that a lot of women like myself watching you say those words want to just tear up or break down crying. And particularly at a time like this where we're isolated from each other and from the people, maybe our best friends or people who have been supporting us to have you say those words and speak those words over us and us is um, the greatest gift that you mm -hmm. could give aside from writing the book as a gift. I, I wanna talk about, um, well, first let me back up, talk about thunder a little bit to me. I love thunder and the way it, I'm on a hill in Tennessee and the way that it, the echoes and rolls and rolls in the power of it. And um, just talk about that thunder and the story. Um, thunder plays a part as the nickname of um, Anna that Jesus gives to her. You know, he calls her little thunder. And this for me represents her, her fierceness, really her roaring, her, um, her anger, her outrage, her rebelliousness. It's all of this thundering feeling inside of us um, that is important, I think, in a woman's life. It plays a role. And I have said numerous times now, so I'll repeat it. This is her superpower. It's her ability to bring this kind of reverberating passion to her. Um, her quest and her quest is to be this voice in the world. You know, she said to be forgotten is the worst of all. And she, she, and this is of course, you know, what we know if she ever existed happened to her. Um, but thunder, haven't you felt it quaking inside of you? And um, it needs a place it needs a place to be in the world and in our lives. So we have to figure out how to let unleash that. I think the saddest thing is when someone shuts your thunder down and tries to cap it off and, and silence, silence that power and that passion. And yep. so, yeah. So thank you for giving women permission to uh, explore that and, express it. So I do want to um, ask you about a quote that you have on page 75. God relegated my sex to the outskirts of everything. And it goes on from there. Um, yeah, this is a very pivotal moment in the story. And you have uh, 
expressed express that but again i think that's something that is really playing out in society right now it's amazing to me with the book coming out um how it <laughs> how it how it parallels with current events in our society so um i do think that there is a surprising relevance in this story um it's both surprising and not surprising that something 2,000 years ago, uh, a life portrayed fictionally 2,000 years ago could have relevance in the 21st century. And yet I, I really think it does. It has to do with women's voices and refusal to be silenced. This particular past, a quote you just read about, um, she has a moment where she realizes God has relegated my sex to the peripheries of everything. Now, of course, what she's really saying is that the interpretations of the divine have done this. And these interpretations, just like the scripture, were written by men for men. Women didn't figure in it really at all. They were wildly invisible and it's something like less than 2%. I think it's actually 1.1% of all the words in the Bible are spoken by women. So there is a, a lack, a missing feminine historically, theologically, in all kinds of ways, doctrinally, basically, that we have to deal with. And um, I have seen tremendous progress over the last 20, I'm trying to think, 24 years since I wrote my memoir, The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. And yet, there is still a big problem where this is concerned. So the peripheries of everything, there is always a moment in our lives, it seems like, where this dawns on us, where you, you realize it. And it's painful. It feels like a loss. And I had moments like that as a child. I've had moments like that all through my life where you realize this. Um, there are gendered spaces in the church and within religion. There's the periphery and there's the center where meaning is made and um, symbols are made where the real thing happens. Women typically aren't in the center. That bothers me. Also, we don't have the imagery of the divine um, that's feminine. So Anna is introduced to Sophia, which is the feminine spirit of, of God in the Bible. It's called Ruark in the Old Testament. The New Testament in the Greek is Sophia. And Anna learns how to um, relate to this feminine spirit. And she wonders why she never prayed to her before once she learns about her. And her life becomes um, really centered in that feminine spirit. That is missing largely in religion. Also, we don't have the language, the feminine language in religion. So all of this is to say there's just a lot of missing feminine and missing women within religion. And that is part of a huge motif in this book. Can you talk a little bit about the, the meeting of Jesus and about her meeting Jesus? Yes. Um, I wish, I wish I could quote uh, so many readers who have said to me that they felt like they met Jesus again in this book for, for the first time. Um, there's a wonderful book that I relied on a lot as I was reading about the historical Jesus, and it was it's written by Marcus Borg, and he um, I think the title is Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. It helped me shape a lot of how I would portray the character of Jesus. So when I say meeting Jesus, um, I'm talking about how we meet him in these pages. And how Anna meets him is, um, is similarly, I think. She, she falls in love right away. I wanted to have a big love in this 
story. I wanted, I felt like they deserved that to have a great love. And yet it was, it was conflicted also. So if you had to say, what is the one thing that I wanted to do in bringing Jesus into this story? It would be to portray his humanity. He's a human being in this story. And we've lost some of our, um, we've lost some touch with that. I think, you know, it's been eclipsed by how his divinity. So I wanted to return to that human Jesus because he really was kind of extraordinary to say the least. And um, a lot of people seem to be meeting him in the pages again. Um, So I, I like that. Which possesses its own special magic. Um, That's with you being a divine muse and in the process of bringing the story to life. As many things as I want to ask you, we have promised to give fans their moment. So we have some fan questions or reader questions, okay, to uh, readers or fans, fans or readers. But um, we have some reader questions who are fans of yours that want to ask you some things about the story. So, Sue, I'm going to take a few minutes and ask you a few of those, if you don't mind. Um, and, and guys, please forgive me because I don't have your names precisely, and I am going to... I'm not going to get it right, but from KJ Skiba, please tell me more about the folklore of Lilith, the demon who I hadn't heard of before. Yes, Lilith had to be in the story, I felt like. She was a very prominent mythological figure of Babylonian origin, actually. Um, She was a demon originally, and she evolved throughout history and became a kind of feminist icon. This didn't happen really until maybe the Middle Ages when um, the aspect of her myth was that she was the first wife of Adam, not Eve. It was Lilith. And this didn't originate in the first century, this this particular story, which is why my character, Anna, didn't know about this. She only knew of of Lilith as this demon figure who would prey on pregnant women and infant newborns. That was, that was what they gave her. Um, The story that developed later is quite a doozy. I mean, in the middle ages, it was told that she married uh, Adam and she refused to be a good helpmate, as they say, to him. She refused to lie beneath him. She would say, well, why can't I have the dominant position? And she was just an all-around so-called bad wife. <laughs> so she left. She just flew away. And then, she, you know, he got Eve. Uh, so that's kind of the story about her. But she was fierce. She was, um, she had agency, you know, she had authority and she, um, I think she appears in this story as um, somewhat as a feminist icon. There's a line where it thunders and women at that time would say, Lord, protect me from Lilith because they thought the thunder was Lilith. And Anna says, Lord, bless the roaring. So she kind of blesses what Lilith is about. Uh, That's the way I'm going to start waking up every morning now. That's going to be what I say. Lord, bless the roaring, you know, before I begin my day. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll help me have a little more energy. So I love the fact that these questions come from readers from everywhere, um, all over, all over the world. Katie, Uh, ask, how did you develop the idea for Anna being the muse for um, Antipas? Is that right? Antipas, yeah. Yeah. latest mosaic. Oh, the mosaic. This image, and I I have a picture of it here. Let's see if you can see it. Can you see that? Oh, yes. So this is um, the mosaic that was discovered 
In Sepphoris, which is the setting for part one, this city existed as the capital of Galilee at the time of Jesus. It was four miles from Nazareth. And there is a great deal of historical speculation by scholars that Jesus probably um, worked there, that um, he, it was a cosmopolitan place, and that he may have been exposed to a very sophisticated kind of um, environment over there and learned and was literate and spoke many languages. I mean, there's all kinds of speculations about it. And Anna certainly did too. But there's, as you know, it's gone now. But there's archaeological uh, exploration going on in Sepphoris, and they uncovered this mosaic, which is known as the Mona Lisa of Galilee. It's quite, it, it really is quite beautiful, I think. Um, so when I saw that, Oh, I should say it was, it's dates to the third century. It's not dating to the first century, but you know, I'm a novelist, so I can play with the facts a little bit. And I did note that, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I created this mosaic based on this one. And originally I was thinking that it would represent Anna's face, that she would somehow have this mosaic made about her, made of her face. I didn't know how. Right. And that this face would come to mean the lost feminine in religion. That's how I think of Anna, as imaging this lost feminine. And of course, it veered off of that. And Anna became, well, she needed to get Judas free and so it became a more of a plot necessity that this mosaic but I loved getting it in there it really has multiple purposes uh, one of them was that she could um, barter with Herod Antipas I'll do your mosaic if you'll free my brother Judas and that was a important domino that I needed to fall as I wrote the story but it also um, kind of reflects that vision she had. You know, I made Anna very visionary. And um, she, she has this vision of her face and a sun. And this is kind of what it reminds Anna of this mosaic encapsulated. It was just a, a fascinating thing to me, this mosaic. Well, I'm going to color outside the lines and ask you a question that's my question, and then I'm going to go right back to the reader's questions. What was one of the biggest surprises as a writer that you experienced in the writing of the story that actually surprised you? Well, I'll say, first of all, that the biggest surprise was that I wrote the book at all. You know? <laughs> um, uh, this, and in a way, not a surprise to me at all. <laughs> I, I felt, I hope this doesn't sound um, overblown, but I, I felt as I was writing the book that I was um, put here to write it, that I was meant to write it. And I, I think authors, writers, maybe need to feel that way about work they're very passionate about. But I certainly felt that way. I longed to write this book. And once I made the decision to do it, I, I never looked back. So that was a surprise. But about the writing itself, the story, um, hmm, maybe two things that surprised me. One was that Judas turned out to be Anna's adopted brother. I didn't see that coming. I wanted to bring Judas into the story. I wanted to humanize Judas in a way that I was trying to bring humanity to all these characters. Uh, Judas, is, it's not just a black and white thing, good and evil thing with him. I mean, there's complexities there and I wanted to try to portray why he did what he did so that we could at least understand it better, even though it went it went wrong, uh, his motivations. 
I saw it as a political theater. So it, I wanted to bring him in. Now, how am I going to do that? And so I was just going to have him kind of just show up and be somehow wedged into the story. And then one day it occurred to me, well, I have this theory, you see, as a novelist, that the way you write a novel is you take a bad situation and you make it worse. That's how it goes for a long time. And so I thought, how can I make this even worse? Oh, what if he is the brother of Anna? Then I made him a ha uh, an adopted brother. That made it somehow worse in the sense that there was much more to unpack, much more emotional resonance, much more complexity. So that's how he got in the story. And yeah, it was kind of a little shock. And I'll say quickly, the other one was the appearance of Tabitha, her friend. She did not exist in the story, the first draft of part one. When I went back and read part one, I thought something is missing. What is it? And it's just uh, this intuition I had, really. And I, um, I decided there was this whole friend she needed to balance her very serious scholarly uh, pursuits. And she just, and, and it brought in this other story that had a big impact on the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Tabitha has, well, she has her Me Too moments. And it was important for her story to be in there. I could talk a long time about that, but we don't have the time. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, because it, it seems like uh, exactly that, the kind of book that you're reading that surprises you in the, in the process of the story of things that you don't see coming, and um, which it is delightful as a reader. Um, Sarah asks, who was your inspiration for Yaltha? Oh, Yalta, I, I love this, actually. Love that question because she came to me in a serendipitous way. I am, uh, I sign up for this um, in my year, my 14 months of research for this book before I wrote a word. I signed up for something called academia.edu or something like that. And it was they would send me lectures that had pertained to topics that I selected. And I get this paper one day and it's about, it's called um, an early feminist rendering of Yaltha in the Talmud. And it was written by this scholar in Potsdam, Germany. And I discovered this figure. It's kind of a, in a way, a mythological figure or an allegorical figure is better, who um, was used in Hebrew stories as a cautionary tale, as in, don't be like this. You know? right. So she's doing all of these things, but don't be like that. And these stories were handed down. They go way, way back, and there's quite a few of them. My favorite one was when Yaltha entertains a guest for dinner and the guest is quite it's a man he's a little arrogant and he decides that she does not need to be served at the table with him so she has to go to the kitchen well she's not happy about this and she goes in the kitchen and shatters according to the story 300 jars of wine so she expressed her anger maybe inappropriately but she did it this is Yaltha. And when I read that, I thought, a character is born. <laughs> and right. that's how she came into the story. Uh, so that's where she comes from. And the word Yaltha means gazelle in Aramaic, which I can't really get any symbolism from. But she's, um, she has a history as a very ferocious uh, female who you don't want to be like, but you really kind of sort of do. Kind of sort of do. When the, <laughs> when the, when the time requires it, when yeah. you need to step up, right? Or step off, right? 
Um, that was the next question from Dallas Dream Love B. And so you just answered that. Jill, this is our, our last reader question. Jill asks, what inspired you to write the beautiful story to begin with? How did the idea ever come to you, the actual conception of it? Yeah, in a way, this story has probably been brewing in me for a long time. Um, you know, I've studied um, feminist, feminist theology and feminist spirituality for, oh, 20, 30 years at least. Well, more than that now. I'm getting up there. So it's been, um, I think, evolving. And in a way... Maybe this book is the integration of all my work. It feels that way to me. I didn't realize it until I finished writing it that it felt that way to me, but it does. Uh, so there's that. But it was the catalyst was actually when I was reading that National Geographic article. That is, I, I refer to this in the author's note mm -hmm. of the novel. So if you haven't zoom through the book and and um, read it yet I'll, I'll just give a little quick thumbnail of that the uh, um, I was reading the National Geographic article about a fragment of papyrus that is titled G the wife of Jesus the gospel of Jesus wife excuse me the gospel of Jesus wife it was introduced to the world by a Harvard professor believed to be authentic and in this uh, manuscript, I mean, it's just a little fragment and it looks exactly sort of kind of like the cover of the book, <laughs> that piece of papyrus. It's a little wider actually, but that's about the size of it. And it refers to Jesus having a wife. Jesus refers to his wife in it. Well, it turns out, sadly, this is a fraud. It's a... Uh, um, it was discovered. But you know, when I read that, my whole body was electrified by it. And it set off my imagination. And when I discovered later that it was not authentic, that it, I didn't even care because uh, my imagination had already left the building. I mean, right. um, so that's how it started really. And I never looked back. The question I asked myself that day as I sat there thinking, the wife of Jesus, I thought, if she ever existed, she would be the most silenced woman in history. That I couldn't abide. So I decided I would write her story, and I did that. I, I was so excited to come into my writing room and write this story for about four and a half years. And I loved giving her a voice, and that was, that was my purpose, was to give this woman a voice who may have existed or may not have. I don't know. Um, so- She does now. She does in the book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she does now. So it was, it, it sort of started that way. And my, I mean, Anna is also the inspiration for this story, I guess you would say. Um, beautifully done. Let me see if there's. Um... What forces do you think now are at work? Um, the story of Anna was silenced by history. What, um, Forces do you think are at work now to silence contemporary women and what works to embolden them? Mm. When I read the comments of you readers online about that, uh, I was kind of awed by what you said. Some incredibly, um, just very intelligent, moving comments about it. So I learned, I learned a lot from you, in fact. Um, I, I say all the time, I'm always learning what I'm doing from my readers. I think uh, silencing today, um, 
why does why are women silenced today why do we allow ourselves to be silenced today it's an internal thing essentially i think there are forces externally there are forces internally sometimes we just um are afraid you know fear is a big deal in women's lives back when i wrote the dance of the dissident daughter I mean, this was, as I said, I was writing it for years before it was published 24 years ago. I would have dreams, night dreams, like your sleep dreams, of the Nazis coming to my door wow. and the witch burners coming to my door. Mm -hmm. That's fear. That's fear. Now, it's archetypal because. It's in the collective history of women. So if you feel like if you voice yourself and you tell your truth and you're a free woman with a, your own authority, your own agency, and you speak, sometimes the backlash comes. Whew, and you think the witch burners are going to get you. So I had to grapple with that for years. Uh, Anna, I think, grapples with that to some extent, too. So it's a matter of, um, oh, I'm going to quote my favorite David White line, line of poetry. Revelation must be terrible if you can never hide your voice again. It is terrible, but it's beautiful and it's freeing and it's amazing and um you know i said to myself so what so what and i'll say one other thing about that <laughs> about the silencing and what where that comes from um i once had to give a um lecture on the dance of the dissident daughter at a large gathering where 600 people were in the audience and it was male and female and it was a uh, a Protestant church thing. And during the Q&A, a priest stood up and he was an Episcopal priest and he, he shook his finger at me and he said, I hope my daughters are never like you. All right, I remember kind of standing there and I said to myself, plant your feet. Raise your chin. Do not be afraid. And I wasn't. But it's a learned thing, believe me. And some of it has to do with that core of knowing who we are, um, that authentic place in us, that we can stand our ground on that. So those are just random thoughts about... Um, women and what emboldens us i mean just freeing ourselves to to speak and to be who we are um also there's a whole thing in part one about freeing god which you cannot imagine the pleasure it gave me to write this um where anna blurts out why don't we free god and jesus says well, I'd like to know more about how that happens. I think that is what her journey is about as well. It's about freeing her own concept of the divine from these narrow, male-interpreted ways we've done it. We, I mean, God is a mystery anyway. But um, So there's a lot of freeing going on in the story. <laughs> And it's a good time for a lot of freeing um, and, um, and divine longing and uh, divine mystery. It's a good time in the world. And your book is amazing and original and, and you've done a beautiful job with it. And thank you so much for um, giving booksellers, you know, a, a gift to offer to readers. And we appreciate you so much. I know all <laughs> stores do, but Parnassus Books is thanking you specifically today for letting us take part in
the book club book tour and virtually being online with you. And I just want to tell all the readers that are in our area, Parnassus Books, you know, uh, you can contact the store, go to parnassusbooks.net. And I believe if, um, well, that's the best thing to do. And you can, uh, they're just the greatest people in the world to work with and, and uh, to share the powers. I, I can, um, I can testify to that. <laughs> I've, I've been to Parnassus numerous times and love the store and it's a great, it's a great store. And Patchett and her partner there, what's her name? Karen. Karen. Karen, right. I met, I saw Karen not long ago. Um, so thank you and thank Parnassus and thank independent bookstores. But today, my heart is full because of these readers and I want to thank you too for reading the book and for engaging with it and coming up with questions and thoughts and let's keep reading and keep the discussion going. So Absolutely. the, the next um, part, second week of the book tour, I mean the book club, yeah, it's a tour too, starts Sunday. So we can start to think about part two. Sunday, May 10th, and it's going to be great for me, not only in taking part today, Parnass is taking part today, but in us continuing as readers to take part in the book club all the way through. So we'll be with you every week. We're just going to be on the other side of the camera and won't be able to see you, but we'll be, we'll be with you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Sue, so much for this. And, and thank you to your publisher, Penguin, for making this possible.